Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, we're, as, as Sean mentioned, the world we're living in today is the result of social media companies' failure to protect democracy on their powerful platforms. They've said as much on multiple occasions, that's not the debate. Today we're here to ask what we can do about it concretely. So I built and research what's called civic tech. That's tech for democracy, tech for civic engagement, inside and outside of governments. We had an event yesterday, civic tech for democracy, supported by the EU. Academics sometimes call it, sometimes call it pro-social tech, pro-social being the things that bring us together, that improve the bonds between people and the collective. And ironically enough, it was our social networks that became host to the most coordinated anti-social tech that we've seen yet in the age of the internet. They accepted money to host these anti-social, anti-democratic efforts. So I'm eager to be here today with you to consider what we do as civil society, as government, to bring some oversight and help tech take on some responsibility for what they've built. And a quick life story on me, I've always been excited about computers and tech, and I've always thought that we should use new tech and new possibilities to, to protect democracy, to take on you know, pro-social challenges of the day. And these two, challenge, these two passions led me to an organization that gives digital trainings for community organizing groups in the US. So I helped scrappy groups punch well above their weight using the internet, using social media, to have impact they wouldn't otherwise have. I made sure they used up all of their Google ad grant money on search. I taught them YouTube and email marketing campaigns, and I insisted that they take full advantage of social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. I was inspired by all the ways people can come online to help and engage in democracy and fight for a better society. And basically, I don't come here today as a cynic. But I witnessed something unsettling in 2016. I'm sitting in the Hillary Clinton campaign headquarters in Brooklyn, and actually I'm standing at a standing desk, not because it's healthy, but because we literally didn't have room for any more chairs uh, in the office. And we're fighting against the Trump campaign and its various allies around the world with some of the best tech and digital teams you won't hear about. And I'm hearing from our supporters, especially women, that any time they post something publicly on social media expressing support for our candidate, they get hit with some of the most vile language you can imagine. Rape threats, death threats, so they stop expressing themselves politically online, or they do so only in closed venues. And political science research suggests that hearing from peers on their positions has a big influence on your positions, and our supporters were silenced on social media. We now know this was a coordinated campaign to achieve just that, and that no amount of user flagging would have convinced the leadership at these social media companies to take this, this pattern seriously, because it wasn't one-off, it was a pattern. And that's not all. We were seeing white nationalists outside the US operating over different IP addresses and overnight time zones, and they were working together in closed social media groups to coordinate their attacks. What really hurt me was they were using the social media tactics I've always advocated for with pro-democracy groups. They were coordinating the strategic timing together, creating visual memes. They were taking advantage of detailed nuances of how content moves on algorithms and social networks. Except they were doing it to harass young people and attempting to suppress votes, as Sean mentioned. We were able to fight back and catch some of the digital voter suppression memes before they took off. We were unsuccessful in slowing the harassment. And what we saw at the time was, of course, only the tip of the iceberg of what we'd later learn. I didn't know at the time that Russia literally had a team of 1,000 people working social media while social media companies were asleep at the wheel. The Facebook newsroom blog at the time talks about virtual reality and adding mini games to Facebook Messenger. In the months that followed Donald Trump's election in the US, there was a deafening silence of leadership, both inside our government and our private sector. The social media companies denied responsibility for the fact that they could have been an influence until the subpoenas and hearings piled up. And then, over the course of 2017, the numbers they gave us changed. Suddenly, it was tens of millions of voters who had been exposed to propaganda rampant on their sites. Suddenly, it was thousands of actors involved in pushing. It was all there in the data. So for me, the issue is that as a company, Facebook epitomizes a belief system common across Silicon Valley that celebrates solving problems with technology rather than people. There's a culture of not wanting to hire too many people. And of course, there are financial reasons, but I think it's more about venture capitalists and engineers want companies that scale. And there's a pride in not needing more people if you're clever enough to reverse engineer and diffuse a problem. That's why the things we share on social media, whether it's beautiful poetry or lazy racism, is reduced to content and text. The emotionally provocative content triggers engagement and the, the algorithm spreads it further. They're not looking at the individual words of what we're saying, unless a user flags it. So the obsession with a text solution rather than a human solution is also why we hear so much these days about artificial intelligence. Facebook suggested to US Congress that AI is an answer to things like the disinformation campaigns that we're seeing. But do we know the data is good enough? 
Do we think that human beings can't game new systems that they see? People are really good at gaming systems. And it's not an engineering problem, it's a social problem. Which, an analogy someone came up with yesterday at the Civic Tech for Democracy event, every time you move your white chess piece, they get to move their black chess piece. It's not a solvable tech solution. So Facebook has built the most universal platform humanity has ever witnessed, with over two billion people. That's larger than many world religions. But they've expected until now to operate it with a skeleton crew, with no local language or social understanding in many places. Or if they hire people, it's often moderators in roles where they don't get to change the policies. They're just following the rule book. These departments in trust and safety are often about mitigating risk without jeopardizing growth. And that's not just Facebook, that's across social media companies. So what should we do to make social media better for democracy? There's five ideas to put forth. I'm really eager to hear from all of you. We need to confront, number one, we need to confront the fact that it's a holistic information ecosystem that Facebook significantly contributes to and that the public sphere and information and media affect our open elections and democracies. This came up earlier today. It goes well beyond individual harassment. An informed citizenry is fundamental to open elections, and yet Facebook suggests things like polling the audience to give media outlets a trust score. This is crazy. The average opinion doesn't work in democracy when it comes to certain things like minority rights or press freedom. It's why we have independent branches of government like a judiciary uh, to protect those groups and not put it to a popular vote. Facebook keeps coming back to polling the audience rather than taking values-based stands to protect the media ecosystem that informs our elections. Number two, considering what happened on Facebook in Myanmar, hiring people with local language and local socio-political understanding everywhere you are open for business should be a rule of running an internet business, a platform. It will be more expensive, and that's the cost of running a huge platform and owning half of the global online ad market, but also proving to us that you hired them. Facebook won't share information about their trust and safety capacity by region. We don't know. We have to trust them. And I don't think many of these problems started in 2016. It's when, in the US, it's certainly when we became aware of them, but civil society groups in Myanmar and other places have been flagging these issues for well before the 2016 US election. Um, and I want to get to you guys, so I'll go quickly. Number three, I would love to see Facebook not get played by disingenuous attempts to harass the referees. The purveyors of societal level disinformation campaigns are targeting tech companies because they are the arbiters of truth now, whether or not they ever wanted that job. Claiming unfairness to get special treatment has worked. False equivalence is when you're denying climate change and you harass the media into saying that both sides have a good point when the science doesn't support that. And Facebook and other tech companies have recently demonstrated a troubling willingness to offer both sides when one side is strategically poisoning the public sphere. It's not a one-off fact check, it's a holistic campaign. Number four, how big should one company be? Should Facebook operate WhatsApp and Instagram in addition to Facebook? Should they also be able to acquire the next up and coming Instagram? Should two companies, Facebook and Google, control most of the online ad industry? And lastly, number five, should we question the practice of embedding company experts inside fundamentally anti-democratic campaigns? Should Facebook ask themselves if it's really worth the extra business? And when it begins in earnest next year, will Facebook again offer the Trump election campaign their embedded employees to master the use of their platform? And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, very much for this invigorating, invigorating intervention. Um, before we open the floor for discussions, I'd like to ask you a question on, on the kind of parameters of control, mm -hmm. because clearly there's a lot of negative consequences. Uh, you mentioned quite a few, and they also came up on Sean's, Sean's um, intervention. So um, w from your point of view, there, there is a lot of need for regulation.